uh, first of all, obviously the, the topic is there front and center. Uh, I'll, I'll be talking on this along with uh, Laura, uh, just to give you an idea of how we're going to approach it. Um, and in the interest of, I think, probably full and frank disclosure, my um, practice in chronic pain, um, which, which I've dealt with for quite a long time, is exclusively uh, on behalf of defendant insurer um, clients. Um, now, that would, of course, uh, pose a, a bit of a problem in presenting this because this is a Chambers webinar that all are invited to. It's, it's very democratic and a, a broad church on that basis. Uh, and so it, it probably isn't the forum for me to start uh, describing um, all of the uh, ways in which we deal with uh, surveillance evidence, for example, uh, and so on. Although I'm sure, I'm sure that we will touch on the practice of that when, when Laura deals with her section. So, so in light of that, what we're going to do uh, is deal with topics uh, in, within this really very interesting and, and often complex and complicated area of, of law and litigation that are of universal application uh, and they are of, um, they create problems and difficulties, whether you're acting on behalf of a claimant or, or whether you're defending a, a particular claim. Uh, and my focus will be on uh, initially on the medical side. So I'm going to run through uh, various problems that you encounter in practice, most notably actually with the very first step in a chronic pain case, which is putting, what label do you put on uh, the, particular, um, the particular condition? I, I use that term neutral at the moment condition. We'll, get, we'll go into a bit more sophistication for, for that in a moment. Um, Laura then, once I've dealt with that, is going to deal with some case updates. Um, there's some interesting cases on, on these types of uh, issues. Uh, there'll be a little bit in there about uh, surveillance and uh, practice and procedure, which uh, of course is of general application. Um, and then at the end, we, we'll come back and we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time, uh, probably not too long on tactics, because as I say, it's, it's, it's very much um, dependent on, on, on which stripes you, you have. Are you uh, acting for the claimant or defendant? Um, as to tactics, but we'll, set, we'll, we'll do our best to present some useful points on that. We welcome questions. There is a tab that you can use to ask questions in the, uh, either on the Zoom webpage or app that you are using. And we'd encourage that and we'll, 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 visit, we'll re revisit that at the end of the, the seminar rather than as we're um, going along. Um, and so um, the, finally, the, um, the only thing I should say is that um, if I seem a bit nervous at the moment, it's not because I'm talking to you, it's that um, about half an hour ago, my daughter went out for her first driving lesson. So uh, I'm I'm, hopefully she comes back and hopefully you don't see any car coming through the French door behind me um, in about 30 minutes. Um, but uh, it also makes me feel quite frankly, uh, a little bit old. So uh, I shall crack on uh, with this. And the first question, that we want to ask is, is this, isn't it? What is pain? Um, a fundamental question. And here is a, I was about to say useful, but I, let's just say it is, it is a definition uh, that, that is in frequent use. Uh, and that was produced by, as one can see, the International Association uh, for the Study of Pain. And you'll find this, repeated in, in various reports and, and so on. Uh, and it is worth uh, some consideration because uh, it's an extremely slippery uh, and difficult definition to get a hold on. In part, it describes a, a medical condition. Uh, in, in other senses, it's, it seems to be almost a, a, a philosophical uh, conundrum. I think we can all understand the first part, uh, an unpleasant sensory experience. Um, that, that's easy to understand, but, but note, note the use of the adjective emotional. Uh, now, already we have within this definition, uh, a sense of subjectivity being imported uh, into what is felt. Um, it's not purely uh, 
an electrical impulse and response, uh, but there is something else going on that is particular to the individual and to their emotional reaction and experiencing of what they feel. And it becomes even more complex when we look at uh, the causation element of this definition. We see it's associated with, and again, we can easily understand uh, associated with actual damage. Um, that's not hard to understand. We all know how we feel when we cut our finger. Um, potential damage, well, what, does, what exactly does that mean? I mean, potential is something that's not actually materialized. Um, how can that be? Um, how can that cause pain? Uh, and matters get even more complex when you look at the final qualification uh, associated with or described in terms of such damage. Uh, it, it difficult, again, to, to really get a handle on uh, precisely what is meant uh, by that. Um, so the, the definition that's used uh, is, a, is a trickery, tricky and slippery one and subject to all sorts of uh, individual um, responses. And that is why chronic pain cases are so difficult. They are different from a bo broken bone because we have a, a highly uh, significant and important subjective uh, reaction. The next uh, problem uh, that we face in these cases uh, is, I think, one of phraseology. And this is very much a problem that's caused often by we lawyers. Uh, and we, so, I mean, I've, I've been saying it throughout, talking about chronic pain cases. Well, what is chronic pain? Well, chronic pain uh, is now, it used to be defined actually as pain that had persisted for um, six months. Uh, under, under new classification, and I'm going, I'm going to come to that, the new ICD-11 classification uh, at the end of my section. Um, it's actually pain that's persisted for at least three months, so it's been reduced down. So chronic pain, regardless of its cause, is pain that has persisted for at least three months. Uh, but uh, we often also use it and we, 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 as, a, as a description of the diagnosis. Um, that is to say, uh, our description of the causes uh, and the condition giving rise to uh, the, the feeling of chronic pain. So in actual fact, when you read chronic pain, it doesn't necessarily mean just pain that's persisted for at least three months. It will mean often a chronic pain disorder, a chronic pain syndrome, or the somatoform type disorders uh, that I set out um, below. Now, it's extremely important in, in, uh, in these types of cases to um, work out precisely what the diagnosis is that your experts are, are um, giving to you. Uh, too often in reports, there will be vague assertions of chronic pain disorder uh, with really inadequate um, detail uh, and attention to proper classification uh, being provided. Uh, now, th these are the types of uh, the broad headings uh, that we have uh, for chronic pain diagnoses. Um, complex regional pain syndrome, I'll come to that uh, in, a, in a moment. Fibromyalgia, I'm not gonna go into uh, as part of my section. Laura's going to talk about a, a quite interesting case that dealt with a lot of issues to do with fibromyalgia. So I'll, I'll leave that aspect of it um, to her part of the talk. Um, and we also have a distinction between chronic pain disorders and chronic pain syndromes, uh, which I will um, come to. Uh, the final bullet point I'll deal with are, are problems that are posed by uh, ICD-10 and 11 and the DSM-5. Uh, um, for those that don't know, and as I said at the beginning, we've got a broad spectrum of um, uh, attendees from the claimant and defendant side, but also a broad spectrum from 
in terms of seniority. So um, forgive me if I, I perhaps deal with some points which you, you may already know, although it's always good to revise these things, I think. Um, the ICD is uh, the International Classification of Diseases, uh, and that is published by the World Health Organization. And it's a pretty compendious description uh, of various diseases. Um, it was version 10 uh, until uh, pretty much the end of last year, I think September last year, when a new classification uh, version 11 came in. I'll deal with that a bit later. Um, the DSM-5, that came in in, I think, 2013, uh, and that's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of um, Mental um, Illnesses, uh, which is, I think is an American publication and is, uh, as the title would suggest, is geared very much towards the psychological uh, and psychiatric uh, side of matters. Um, now, they both, both of those classifications deal with uh, the same types of conditions and possibly classify them in slightly different ways. So it's, that's fertile ground for getting confused. So I thought that it would be worthwhile us having a little look um, at those as well. So uh, here's um, complex regional pain syndrome and how it's caused, uh, a helpful little image. Um, you will see on the uh, left-hand side of your screen, a forearm, there's an injury to the arm or hand or wrist. Uh, that injury uh, causes a stimulus to be sent along the uh, nervous system to the brain. Um, the, the thinking is that the uh, pain impulse felt by the brain um, actually sends an impulse back to the site um, where, of the original injury. And that causes, uh, bodies react, um, COVID a classic example, but bodies react to external stimuli in these way by um, inflaming. And what happens in CRPS is that the uh, stimulus impulse response mechanism essentially gets stuck in a, a, in a circular loop. And so uh, the, the injury site uh, becomes continually inflamed. Uh, and so the initial injury, um, one wouldn't have thought would have caused any particular problem. But unfortunately, by, by means of a, a malfunctioning in the central nervous system and its response, uh, the, the injury site does not recover, or at least it might recover from the original injury, but it will suffer from chronic inflammation. Uh, and these types of cases are, are relatively easy uh, compared to the others to understand and diagnose because there are very clear physical symptoms. Uh, often there's uh, redness of the skin, there's mottling of the skin, there is swelling, uh, there can be, uh, there's often you know, discoloration. Uh, all sorts of other unpleasant things can happen, nails can become brittle and so on and so forth. So that type of um, chronic pain disorder uh, is a relatively straightforward one to diagnose. Um, as I say, Laura's going to deal with uh, fibromyalgia. Um, I'm going to deal here with uh, the question of uh, a disorder or a syndrome. And again, this comes back to my theme uh, of being precise and specific uh, with your part 35 experts about what it is they're saying a claimant is suffering from. Now, um, chronic pain disorder uh, is, a, is a, 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 a phrase that is used to mean that there are physical and psychological changes, and they've, they've occurred uh, owing to the presence of chronic pain, so that there will be um, some discernible um, physical or psychological problem in consequence of the chronic pain. Um, an example, well, actually a chronic pain disorder we've seen, complex regional pain uh, syndrome is a chronic pain disorder because we have an injury, we have a reaction, uh, and we then have um, the presence of chronic pain uh, as, a, as a result with physical uh, change and very often psychological change uh, accompanies that 
um, as well. Uh, there are other examples though, from very, my own very recent uh, experience, uh, a, a case of a, a, a gentleman who was a um, who was ex-military. Um, he'd unfortunately suffered PTSD as a result of his service. Um, he'd left the military and was uh, working as a security guard, delivering um, and collecting cash and so on. Um, he he slipped and he ruptured uh, his knee uh, ligament and also caused some damage to the meniscus and cartilage in the knee so we have a physical uh, problem and a physical um, change to the knee um, now in and of themselves that those knee problems could and should uh, have recovered fairly well um, unfortunately they didn't the cartilage and meniscus were, were fine uh, and indeed that the ligament recovered relatively well under surgery but uh, not entirely. Uh, and so this gentleman had to undergo a couple more surgical procedures. And so he was still, he was still experiencing uh, physical pain as a consequence um, of the initial injury. But uh, over time, uh, it, his, his reaction and response to that um, had become uh, excessive or, or disproportionate compared to what one could discern in the injury. Uh, so in that case, the, the pain experts were happy to um, agree that he had a chronic pain disorder because clearly there was some physical trigger for it and there was some ongoing physical reason for it, but quite clearly something had altered uh, and he was a genuine, a genuine claimant. Uh, uh, quite clearly something had altered, uh, which changed his pain response. Now, Chronic pain syndrome is used in a slightly different sense uh, in that there is no discernible physical source for that pain. So unlike our, our, our claimant uh, we've just spoken about uh, in, in, a, in this type of claim, uh, there wouldn't be that ongoing issue in the knee uh, that one could say provide some sort of physical explanation for at least some of the symptoms. Um, here we have an ongoing level of pain, which really doesn't have any physical source that's discernible. Uh, and the reaction to it is uh, abnormal. Uh, in, in litigation, you'll come across these types of cases, sometimes with whiplash being the classic example where it is uh, purely a soft tissue injury, or may well be a low velocity type impact, uh, but that there is presentation for a long period of time uh, of problems which are out of all proportion to and, and cannot be associated with a soft tissue injury uh, from which the claimant um, has recovered. So it's worth bearing that distinction between disorder and syndrome in mind uh, because it's a very important one. Uh, and if we think about these types of cases, what, what the, the, so often the problem for in them is really for both sides is getting a handle on causation now if there's a diagnosis of a chronic pain disorder it's far easier for uh, a trial judge and that's that's whose eyes we need to look at these cases from when we're preparing them it's far easier for a trial judge to understand a chronic pain disorder uh, because there is that physical manifestation of a problem which causes symptoms. Uh, so even though the response may be exaggerated or disproportionate, um, there is that trigger event that's continuing, which can describe it. If there is not that discernible physical source that can describe an ongoing uh, physical problem or description of symptoms, then issues of causation of course become more difficult. So when you see pain experts or psychiatrists or whoever it may be uh, talking about disorders and syndromes, be, be, be very careful to make sure that you pin them down to ensure that that is what they mean, uh, because the consequences for issues of causation uh, can be significant. Now we'll also come across in practice uh, somatic symptom disorder 
Now, this is a classification, as you'll see there, that was introduced by the DSM in 2013. Uh, it bundled up those uh, various other conditions that we note there. And we'll see that it, when we talk about a somatoform disorder or somatic symptom disorder, um, as described by DSM-5, really we're looking at physical symptoms complained of. They're not necessarily there. In fact, they probably aren't there, but there are physical symptoms complained of that suggest an organic injury. But then the organic injury, the physical injury, can't be detected can't be found, there's no physiological explanation. So again, we're thinking about the whiplash type injury, uh, which is soft tissue in nature, no damage to the bony structures. Uh, that should have recovered within six to 12 months or maybe up to two years. Two years might be an important, uh, important tariff uh, with the upcoming whiplash reforms, uh, but Symptoms continue uh, in spite of what should have been and has been a full recovery from the soft tissue injury. Now, those type of somato, that is a somatic symptom disorder according to DSM-5. And if we look back at our, our definition, uh, we'll see that that probably becomes, that falls within the ambit of chronic pain syndromes rather than chronic pain uh, disorders, okay? So it's important to be aware of that terminology as well, because um, as we see, chronic pain syndrome can, can, can also mean, in this case, a somatic symptom disorder. So even though it's described as a disorder, actually, we're probably talking about what, what others would call a syndrome. Uh, persistent somatoform pain disorder is another um, a diagnosis you may come across. Now that appeared in ICD-10, which was the uh, previous version of the ICD uh, classification. And uh, in that we have, it's a very similar um, type of definition as we've seen under DSM. Uh, uh, there is persistent severe and distressing pain. Now, if we compare that description it goes probably slightly further than um, DSM-5 in terms of the intensity of the descriptions. Uh, DSM-5 describes physical symptoms being complained of suggestive of organic injury. Here we have persistent, severe and distressing pain. So it's uh, a more intense uh, type of pain. And it cannot be fully explained by a physiological process or physical um, disorder. So there may be some partial um, explanation in this case, uh, in the case of a persistent somatoform pain disorder, um, there may be some ongoing uh, physical problems, but actually the level and extent of the pain complained of goes beyond um, what we see uh, in terms of pure, a purely physical explanation. Now that, is, uh, that definition is, is, is slightly more difficult to tie into uh, the distinctions between disorders and syndromes, because actually it seems to contain elements uh, of both of them. So again, very important when uh, you have uh, mention of chronic pain disorder, chronic pain syndrome, and a persistent somatoform pain disorder in a report to pin the expert down to what actually they mean in terms of the uh, causation of the pain that is being complained of. Now, uh, as I said, there, there's a new version of ICD-11. The reason I've included ICD-10 is that ICD-11 didn't come in uh, until September of last year. Um, now, given all sorts of things have gone on, uh, lots and lots of part 35 reports that you may have on your books in ongoing litigation uh, will may well still be proceeding with uh, definitions under ICD-10. Uh, and actually ICD-11 moves things along uh, considerably. Uh, it actually talks about chronic pain uh, in, in express terms. Uh, and it, there are probably two different categories that you find there now. Chronic primary pain, 
uh, which uh, is multifactorial. So there'll be a whole interplay of elements uh, causing this, the pain. And it's described as a pain syndrome again, um, in that case, to, to throw more fuel onto the confusing fire we're dealing with when we uh, make a distinction between a disorder and a syndrome. But you'll note that there will be biological factors contributing. So there will be some mechanism of injury uh, when we talk about chronic primary pain. Bodily distress order, this disorder, uh, really seems to be, this is, this is moved more to a sort of somatoform type syndrome where we are looking at a description uh, of bodily symptoms that distress somebody, um, but there, there is an excessive uh, reaction to them. Um, so it, it, we, we can, having seen what uh, the, the definition under the DSM-5 was for uh, persistent somatoform disorder, we can see that there is a, a similarity with these. Uh, one can well see how it becomes confusing uh, to claimants, lawyers, uh, and judges, uh, when we have two different sets of classification, DSM and ICD, uh, talking about uh, chronic pain and uh, pain conditions, uh, describing them in terms of disorders and syndromes, uh, and what, and they're actually in many instances talking about one and the same thing. So it is, as I say, I, if you take anything away from uh, today, it will be to, to make sure that with all of your experts, and it's not just limited to the pain experts, the psychiatrists, psychologists, whoever you might instruct, neurologists, neurometologists, um, are, are extremely clear in how they are um, classifying and categorizing their diagnosis. Continuing the the technical terminology, which, as I say, is probably a, a nice way for, for all of us, whichever um, side of the aisle we, we sit in these uh, cases, um, to, to do a bit of learning. Um, we have the, the following that, that, are, that are, use, are useful to, to understand. Now, the first three, the first two related, nociceptors and nociceptive pain, I'll contrast that with neuropathic pain. And I'm also going to talk very briefly about facet joints. Um, for uh, reasons that I will come to. A nociceptor, so Latin, nocere, or noceri, I think actually it should be pronounced. It means to harm, uh, and a nociceptor is literally a harm receptor. Uh, and it is a sensory neuron, it's a nerve ending, uh, and it responds to uh, any potentially harmful or dangerous stimulus. Uh, which could be excessive pressure, so some sort of mechanical force being applied, uh, excess heat or, or indeed uh, cold, or chemical, acid, something like that. Now, uh, electrical, electrical activity, the longer the neuron is exposed to that dangerous stimulus, the more uh, an, an electrical buildup occurs until it gets to a certain point uh, and it triggers an electrical impulse to the brain uh, and the brain reacts by you taking your hand away from the fire or whatever it may be. Okay, that, that, that withdrawal response. So when we talk about nociceptive pain, what we're talking about uh, is pain that is caused by, that is felt by, uh, or in consequence of a stimulus that is outside the central nervous system. You know, it is it is a red hot chili pepper, or it is boiling water, or it is acid, or it is a knife cutting you, whatever it might be, or it's a car hitting you from behind and you being um, smacked around. Okay, now that is to be compared and contrasted with neuropathic pain, uh, and you will you will see this in reports. You'll see experts talking about nociceptive and neuropathic pain. Neuropathic pain. Uh, is when pain is actually suffered because the nerves themselves are damaged. So your nociceptor, for example, might be damaged. Uh, there are other um, nerves that, that operate within the central nervous system and provide stimulus stimuli to it. They may be damaged. Um, and because of the damage to that nerve, 
uh, there may be pain felt because it, it doesn't function properly. Um, classic example um, are where a nerve is cut and people feel um, phantom pains and that's because of the damage to the nerve. All right, so, uh, but that's, that's different from nociceptive pain because there's no external stimulus, is there? It's, it's just, it's damage in and of the nerve itself. And secondly, and this is the difficult, much more difficult point, uh, is where the central nervous system itself uh, actually begins to alter uh, how it functions. So there's no discernible damage to the nerves. Um, there are no external stimuli, but somehow somebody who perhaps had a whiplash injury um, three or four years ago is still experiencing pain uh, genuinely. Um, and there is MRI evidence of this, of people actually, which has been taken from uh, people's brain activity, and which demonstrates that people, patients who don't have any uh, discernible nerve damage, uh, and there are no external stimuli operating on at the, the, the time, uh, are feeling uh, pain. Uh, now that's of course not nociceptive pain because there's no external stimulus, uh, and it's not caused by organic damage to the, to the nerve, but something clearly in these individuals has happened to the central nervous system um, itself. So, uh, Important to understand that distinction because you'll see it in reports. Important also to understand that distinction uh, in terms of how you're going to deal with it as a practitioner. Uh, now, nociceptive pain, let's go back to our example of the chap who'd injured his knee. Well, look, if, his, if, his, if there is clearly a physical stimulus in the knee because, for example, the meniscus hasn't been repaired properly, that is an external stimulus. It's probably not susceptible pain that he's, he's experiencing. Uh, we understand how that's being caused. A, can anything be done about that meniscus? Um, can anything be done to um, lessen the impact? Uh, and if it can't, is there anything that can be done to lessen the impact on the nociceptor by way of physio, for example, strengthening muscles and the like? But when we're dealing with neuropathic pain, we're dealing with damage to the nerve, which can be a lot more difficult to, um, to resolve. Uh, if we're dealing with neuropathic pain, where actually the central nervous system uh, is operating in a different way. On the claimant side, firstly, you're gonna to have to prove how that's happened. And if there's no external damage, you'll be faced with the usual causation problems. On the defendant side, equally can be a, a significant issue because uh, how does one sort out uh, a malfunctioning central nervous system in the absence of uh, any external, any, any visible, discernible um, evidence of uh, where the damage is? Uh, extremely difficult to do. So, so there will clearly be um, significant causation and, and treatment issues, and they will be dependent on whether it's one or other, it can be a mix of the two, though. Now, um, facet joints, I, I come to these, um, and I, I'll just interrupt my broadcast briefly to let you know my daughter has just come back into the house, so we're, we're, all, we're all safe there, so I can relax for the, the, the next five minutes. Um, facet means a small surface. Okay, so when you, you hear something being multifaceted, and that's what it means, many small surfaces. So a cut gem, a precious stone is, is multifaceted. And a facet joint is a very small joint. You'll see from the attached image, a very small joint uh, located at various points within the spinal column. We have the vertebra um, here, which articulate along these lines. Uh, but then we also have these further joints just you can see just in here and they're quite small little joints now they're very important because they actually restrict movement so that the spine doesn't bend too much as it would if it were purely the the large vertebra that we're able to articulate without them stopping it uh, and they also provide sort of a, a fine ability um, to, to move in in smaller ways because you have a number of extra uh, joints now, damage to those joints 
uh, is very difficult to detect on MRI scans. It doesn't come up, it doesn't come up on x-rays, I don't think. I certainly have never come across it being diagnosed on the basis of an x-ray. Um, I don't think I've seen it on an MRI either. I might, I might be wrong about that. Um, but you will find that certain pain experts, when they're faced with a, a claimant who, who's, who's complaining of chronic back pain, uh, and there are no discernible other physical causes, and the claimant is genuinely describing that pain, having had a whiplash injury, uh, will say that there's a probability, the likelihood is that there is some damage to the facet joint. Now, orthopedic surgeons are very reluctant to uh, go down that route, in, in my experience, um, and I, I flag this up because I suspect that this might be uh, an area um, that we see a bit more of uh, on both sides, because um, increasingly after the whiplash reforms come in, um, litigation in terms of whiplash, uh, certainly in front of the courts, is going to be restricted to injury, whiplash injuries of over two years. And getting to the bottom of actually what's caused that injury is going to involve some, some difficult questions uh, where the injury appears to be purely soft tissue. And uh, in, in, this, uh, in, this, in, this sorts, in these sorts of cases, you will find pain experts describing uh, injury to the facet joints. Now, if they do that, the first question, whether you're claimant or defendant is, are you actually qualified to diagnose facet joint damage. Most of them won't, pain experts probably won't be. Uh, and equally, how are you diagnosing that? Is it just a bit of a thumb in the air? Are you, are you saying that because it's excluding everything else? I can't, under, I don't understand what else it can be. So it must be the facet joints, which isn't a particularly uh, forensic approach. Um, when other, fa other constitutional or psychological factors might be the explanation. Uh, and it, it is extremely important that you are very clear if you are going to proceed with that as a diagnosis or the, the diagnostic basis and the quali qualification of an expert um, to deal with that. OK, now th there's some new nice guidance out as well. And I know I've probably run out a bit longer than I wanted to, but uh, new nice guidance has come out. You might have read about it. It's, it's a big change in how we deal with um, chronic pain. NICE, as you probably know, is uh, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. It's essentially the regulatory body who holds the gateway um, for authorizing uh, treatment and uh, medication. And essentially they say that once you're over the age of 16 and you are complaining of chronic primary pain, then, um, physical exercise and therapy are key. Uh, and that's actually probably some, an orthodoxy that, that's being been urged by a number of different pain experts, certainly on the defendant side for quite a long time. Pharmacological treatments, really only antidepressants is now uh, to be uh, prescribed. And I set out a list there of what's not to be prescribed. And I do that because the suite of pain management treatments that you often see do often contain trigger point injections, quarter cortisone, combination trigger point injections, those are now being, uh, and local anesthetics, those are all now being, um, they, they will not be prescribed according to NICE. Um, and also we see uh, various, you know, uh, profen related and opioid related uh, drugs and paracetamol even are not prescribed. Um, so it's a significant move away in these types of cases from a pharmacological answer uh, and the key is physical exercise and therapy so your schedules of loss and your counter schedules uh, may need uh, updating in due course uh, and the, the link the little website link there is for um is, is for that that guidance so i shall stop sharing my screen at this point having witted on for far too long and i will let laura take over to talk about some uh, interesting cases on chronic pain. Thanks, James. Um, now let me just share my screen. Um, I'm 
There we go. Now, um, James, I'd be grateful if you could give me a nod if my screen is actually being shared. <laughs> Thank you. Um, right, so um, I'm going to uh, take us through um, some of uh, some interesting case law uh, in the realm of chronic pain cases and um, hopefully extract some points of interest. Um, the first case that I'm going to uh, speak about is this case of Malvasini. Um, uh, the, case, the claimant uh, in this matter suffered a uh, minor soft tissue injury uh, to her neck and her left arm uh, when she was moving a patient um, at work. Uh, she worked in a hospice uh, and she was moving the patient from a commode to the bed and her arm got trapped uh, underneath uh, the patient uh, and she suffered uh, uh, an injury. Um, the orthopaedic experts uh, said that her physical injuries uh, should have recovered within two to three months uh, and actually that the sole neurological expert in the case who was for the claimant um, said that ordinarily he would have expected um, recovery within three to four weeks um, that the judge found that the claimant suffered a, a minor soft tissue injury uh, that but for any psychological um, sequelae would have recovered within three months um, so on any analysis we've, we've got what is a minor soft tissue injury um, however uh, as is quite typically the case in these cases, um, the claimant uh, went on uh, to uh, develop widespread um, chronic pain, uh, which she asserted was leaving her uh, disabled and unable to work uh, as a nurse and requiring care. Um, the defendant argued, albeit from reading the judgment, it seems not very seriously, um, that there were elements uh, of uh, malingering uh, or exaggeration, uh, which ultimately uh, the, judge, um, the judge dismissed those concerns. Um, something in this case that is interesting, actually, is that the uh, there were a number of differing opinions on the on the diagnosis that should be given to the um, the claimant's condition. Um, but the judge found uh, that actually, ultimately, it didn't make any difference uh, to the level of damages. Uh, and so, on my reading of the judgment, really declined to make any finding um, in terms of the diagnosis, the range of the diagnoses that were given. Um, uh, the, neuro the neurologist uh, said it was a pain disorder um, and, for example, the psychiatrists um, agreed that there was a persistent somatoform uh, disorder uh, in accordance with the ICT-10 classification. Um, as I said, the judge decided that it, it didn't matter for the uh, purposes of assessment of damages uh, what, the, um, what the diagnosis was uh, and observed uh, that as much can depend uh, on the specialism of the person who's doing uh, the diagnosing uh, as uh, it does on any uh, distinctions that are um, being that, that exist between the criteria they're using. Um, so it's paragraph 62 of, of the judgment that it was the judge's ultimate finding and I'll, I'll just read it out because it is quite an interesting way that it's phrased. Um, he says, therefore uh, I am satisfied on the totality of the evidence but the expert evidence in particular uh, that the presentation of the claimant's condition as described by her to the court and to the medical uh, attendants is of a known and medically recognized chronic condition uh, in which chronic and disabling pain is suffered and genuinely suffered without any discernible physical explanation driven by psychological factors which may be known uh, or discoverable but which are often uh, but which often are not um, so there are no real finding on the actual diagnosis, but a finding that the pain was genuinely being suffered. Um, the defendant's uh, sort of backup argument, secondary argument was, well, look, if the claimant's not uh, exaggerating uh, or malingering, then the claimant's problems that she suffered after the accident uh, demonstrated such, and the term used was exquisite vulnerability uh, and such an all encompassing need to be dependent uh, and unwell that had the accident not occurred, then another minor accident uh, or incident would have served exactly the same purpose. Um, the defendant uh, pinned their contention on, on an incident that had happened while the claimant was gardening uh, in June 2010 um, and said that it was extremely likely that that would have led to a similar clinical picture had the material accident uh, not occurred. Um, that contention was very much based on the opinion of the defendant's uh, psychiatrist. Um, and the, that psychiatrist accepted actually that her reasoning uh, to say that it would have happened in any event um, was tautological, um, that the disorder was going to happen anyway, simply because it, we, do, we do now know it had happened. Um, so the judge uh, rejected that argument. Um, but the claimant's uh, 
neurological experts said um, seemingly when pushed um, that there was, however, a 10% chance uh, that the, uh, the claimant um, or that the symptoms might have occurred at some point in any event. Um, and the judge actually went on to, to, to use that figure. Um, uh, he found that the incidents that the defendant had indicated um, or had said indicated a uh, pre-accident uh, vulnerability um, amounted no more uh, than an indication uh, of the very small chance of a pain disorder arising in, in any event. Um, therefore, while it was accepted that it was highly improbable that but for the accident, the claimant would have suffered as she did, um, it didn't mean that there was not a risk uh, of that happening. Uh, and therefore that 10% figure of the risk of it happening anyway um, was used and 10% was, adducted, was, um, was, was um, deducted from the damages across the board uh, to account uh, for that risk. Uh, the second case um, that uh, I'm going to address here is, is, is only a county court decision, um, but it's an interesting case non uh, nonetheless. Um, it, it involved uh, the claimant um, being injured in an accident at work in a lift. Uh, she was in a lift while it was going up uh, and the, the progress of the lift was, was impeded. Um, such that it stopped and juddered um, and it was, it was a, um, asserted by the claimant that her feet had uh, left the ground at, at some point and so on. Um, she was able to exit the lift, um, but it was found that the, um, the incident was one that was shocking and frightening uh, and that caused the claimant uh, to, signif to suffer uh, significant psychological trauma. Uh, she uh, as a result of the accident suffered um, pain and shock uh, and an insignificant spinal injury uh, of no more than three months. Um, but despite that, within weeks, uh, she developed widespread pain in all four quadrants uh, of her body um, and was being treated as having fibromyalgia. Um, the claimant's case uh, was that uh, the accident had caused fibromyalgia and PTSD. Uh, and the defendant argued um, against that and said that either uh, the claimant's ongoing symptoms were pathological, um, a somatic symptom disorder, or, or that it was a pre-existing constitutional fibromyalgia. Um, and it, 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 in this case, the claimant did have pre, um, factors uh, indicating a pre-existing uh, vulnerability. Or alternatively, the defendant says, you're making it all up, it, it, it's fabricated. Um, but the interesting finding in this case um, was that the judge uh, accepted uh, that uh, the, the trauma um, in the accident had uh, caused fibromyalgia. Um, the, the judge uh, reviewed the scientific evidence um, and the papers in this um, case and found uh, that there was a link between the trauma and the fibromyalgia. Um, and that link was that there had been a disturbance uh, to the REM cycle, so your sleep cycle, um, over a prolonged period, which was the trigger for the fibromyalgia uh, and that sleep disturbance was attributed back to the PTSD and the soft tissue pain uh, caused by the accident and so therefore working backwards that the um, fibromyalgia was consequently caused by uh, the accident. Uh, that's it's quite a long judgment that's paragraphs um, 79 and 144 I uh, sub paragraph I and J uh, if you're interested in, in reading um, about that uh, particular finding uh, the paragraphs around uh, that as well put a bit more put it all into context um, so overall it was found that um, the claimant was suffering fibromyalgia within four to six weeks uh, of the accident but um, that because uh, of a constitutional vulnerability um, that within six years uh, of the accident occurring she would probably have uh, developed fibromyalgia uh, in any event um, so damages were assessed on that basis um, there's an interesting um, point in this case uh, in respect of the fraud pleadings. Um, the the uh, defence was up, um, amended during the course of the proceedings um, to plead fraud, uh, but it was found uh, that they were seriously defective, um, save in respect uh, of one of the um, allegations in respect of previous accidents, um, because they failed uh, to sufficiently particularise the primary facts relied on uh, in inviting the inference uh, of fraud. So that is um, something to be aware of. Um, moving on uh, now just to um, touch on some of the case law 
um, surrounding uh, issues with surveillance evidence. Um, it's a very common feature uh, in chronic pain cases and really surveillance evidence, it, it can be a talk in and of itself, um, but there are a few key principles um, of general ap application um, that can be extracted from the uh, case law, which uh, I think are worth mentioning. Uh, the first case uh, it is up on the slide here, Rule um, and Hume, a Court of Appeal decision from 2001. Um, there's a few helpful reminders uh, within the body of this uh, judgment that I haven't included on the slide um, as to just some of the more basic principles, um, but including that surveillance video uh, is a document uh, within the meaning of CPR 31 and so is subject to all of the normal rules uh, of disclosure. Um, equally, uh, that uh, a claimant is deemed to admit the authenticity uh, of the film uh, unless notice is served by uh, that claimant that they wish to um, that they wish uh, that to be proved at trial. There's a paragraph uh, in this case um, which uh, is, is cited um, with approval quite often in some of the subsequent case law. It's on the screen here. Um, sets out that the starting point in cases where surveillance evidence um, specifically is served late uh, in proceedings by a defendant, um, that the starting point um, where video evidence is available, um, which according to the defendant uh, undermines the case of the claimant uh, to an extent that would substantially reduce the award of damages uh, to which she is entitled, uh, it will usually be in the overall interests of justice uh, to require that the defendant should be permitted to cross-examine the claimant and her medical advisors upon it, uh, so long as that does not uh, amount to a trial by ambush. So that's the starting point where you're dealing with um, applications uh, by a defendant to admit um, surveillance evidence into proceedings. Um, what might be an ambush? I'll come back to that uh, in a minute. Um, but the next helpful case uh, is this case of Hayden. It's a 2016 High Court case. Um, what I would say is that this is, I, I think, quite a good case to read uh, as an introduction to these issues um, if you are just um, beginning to get to grips with them. And, and actually even to remind yourself of first principles uh, if you are well already well familiar with them. Uh, but in this case, uh, the defendant sought to rely on surveillance evidence uh, following uh, the credibility concerns being um, raised by their pain expert, uh, Dr. Monglani. Um, the claimant's claim in this case was pleaded at around one and a half million. Um, she'd had an accident at, at work and said that she couldn't continue working. Um, and what was in issue was the extent of the continuing uh, disability or her continuing disability. Um, significantly, Dr. Monglani had raised uh, his concerns about um, her, the genuineness of her ongoing um, issues 12 months uh, before the trial was due to um, happen. Uh, but the defendant didn't do anything about that uh, until much later. And they actually didn't disclose uh, the surveillance footage uh, until 17 days before the trial uh, and made the application to rely on it only 11 days before the trial. Uh, and as it was, the application was initially listed to be heard on the Friday uh, before the Monday the trial was due to start. Um, the defendant had shown the surveillance evidence uh, to uh, Dr. Monglani, but, but none of the other experts on either side had seen um, the evidence, uh, had seen the footage. Um, the claimant, understandably, ar argued that they were being ambushed and objected to the evidence going in. Um, and the they said that the defendant had acted in bad faith and prejudiced their own expert by um, showing them the footage. So the judge, um, when faced with the application on the Friday before the trial was due to start, uh, vacated the trial uh, and adjourned the application for further consideration by both parties. At the return date, um, the, the parties maintained uh, the same position, um, albeit that the surrounding circumstances had become uh, much clearer by that point. Ultimately, uh, the defendant was given permission to rely on the um, surveillance evidence, uh, but with a, a heavy cost penalty um, imposed. Um, they were ordered to pay the cost of the vacated trial on the indemnity basis, um, plus the cost of both of the application hearings. 
um, the costs of the claimants costs alone being um, assessed at over £40,000. Um, I think perhaps an interesting point, and I think this is paragraph 53 uh, of the judgment, is that the, um, the judge found uh, that if, he, if they'd had available to them all of the um, facts that they did on the return date at the time that the application was originally due to, her, to be heard, um, they probably wouldn't have granted uh, the application. Um, but that at the return date, um, the, the, one of the factors uh, that was playing into the consideration uh, of whether to permit it into evidence was that the judge considered that there was uh, then a level playing field once the claimants uh, experts had seen the footage um, because they thought it didn't undermine the claimants um, case. So I think perhaps a, um, a, a lucky defendant uh, in this case. Um, and it's also quite a helpful decision, as I said, um, because it comments on uh, some of the very common themes uh, arising around surveillance evidence. And there are quite there are some quite helpful paragraphs that state um, some of the relevant principles uh, very succinctly. Uh, the first one being, um, well, what uh, is an ambush, uh, and some given some guidance uh, on the principles of the timing, um, of the disclosure of uh, of uh, surveillance footage. Um, the uh, paragraph that I referred to a, a moment ago that was on the screen from Roland uh, Hume uh, was cited uh, with approval so that the starting point in these cases uh, is that if the evidence will serve to substantially reduce the award of damages, uh, it, well, so, so says the defendant, um, it will usually be in the overall interests of justice uh, that the claim may be cross-examined on it, uh, so long as it's not a trial by ambush. Um, so. What is an ambush? Um, the uh, paragraph that you can see on the screen uh, now um, from Douglas and O'Neill uh, was cited uh, with approval, um, which is, uh, as on the screen, the issue of ambush comes to this. Are the circumstances in which the evidence is disclosed such that the claimant has a fair opportunity to deal with it? Uh, or was the time or circumstances of disclosure such that the court should use its case management powers to prevent the defendant from relying on it? Um, as I said, the judge said that that paragraph was um, helpful. Uh, to that end, um, again, this is just some quite succinct uh, stating of helpful stating of principles. Um, a, a defendant in possession of surveillance evidence uh, should make uh, the decision to rely upon it and disclose it as soon as reasonably possible after receiving uh, sufficient material setting out the claimant's case, which has been endorsed um, by a statement of truth so as to enable the surveillance material to be used effectively. Uh, similarly, um, a helpful paragraph here that it's, it's well recognized the defendant is entitled to wait uh, until a claimant has pinned uh, his cell to the mast of a particular level um, of disability or collection of symptoms through witness, um, witness statement or schedule of loss, um, accompanied by a schedule of, um, by a statement of truth uh, before the defendant needs to undertake the relevant surveillance. Um, but moreover, a very significant factor uh, when, we, when a court is looking at deciding these applications um, for uh, surveillance, particularly when they are late, uh, is the time that the defendant ought reasonably to commission um, such evidence. Uh, essentially, the longer you leave it and the nearer that you get to trial, the more likely it is that the court will regard the delay um, as culpable. Uh, so there is somewhat of a balance. Um, the closer that you get to trial, um, the more likely the delay will be culpable. So some helpful principles there, um, but often it's going to be fact specific, um, I suspect. Um, uh, an interesting point in this case is that uh, Dr. Uh, Manglani had seen uh, the surveillance footage, as I said, um, and the defendants sought to argue, um, well, that's the genie out of the bottle now. We've got to be given permission uh, to rely on this uh, surveillance footage. Um, interestingly, the court concluded uh, that it was right uh, for the claimants experts in this situation uh, not to be bounced um, was the, the term used into showing uh, the footage to their experts before the application hearing. Um, I'll come back to that in a moment because that's in this very um, specific situation where it was an extremely late application. Um, but it, the court found um, that the fact that an expert uh, had uh, seen surveillance evidence 
would not be um, a, a reason that the court has to admit the evidence. Um, it is not simply correct to say, well, look, the genie is out of the bottle. Um, there's comments there that you can see on the screen uh, that experts are well used uh, to putting these things out of their minds. Uh, and that is what they would have to do if the evidence uh, it, it is not permitted. Um, and of course, um, if uh, a witness um, seems to continually um, refer to that, uh, that evidence, um, then that's going to weigh heavily in the evaluation um, of that witness. So what this would suggest uh, is that a defendant can show surveillance evidence uh, to their expert prior to permission being granted, uh, albeit that those experts must then cast that um, footage from their mind if that evidence is later disallowed. Um, I said I'd come back to the point about the claimant um, showing ex um, surveillance footage uh, to their experts in, in a moment, and that's where this last case uh, comes in, uh, Stuart uh, and Kelly. Um, it's a case, in fact, which uh, James actually acted for uh, the defendant, so he will correct me if I uh, misstate anything uh, in this case. Um, but the defendant had been obtaining um, surveillance footage uh, throughout the proceedings, but hadn't disclosed uh, that fact, um, it, including at the case management conference when the directions uh, were made. Um, the claimant's witness statement was served at the end of uh, May uh, 2016, uh, which gave further detail um, about their alleged ongoing difficulties. Um, and at that stage, further surveillance was uh, commissioned. Uh, that was disclosed uh, in August 2016, along with all the prior um, surveillance uh, and, application, and an application uh, to rely on it uh, made at that point. Um, this was three months um, before the, uh, the, the trial date which is very different uh, to the case of Hayden that we spoke about a moment ago, um, where the application was made um, very shortly before trial. And of course, in that case, the judge said, well, it was right for the claimants experts, not necessarily um, to have seen the footage. Um, but in this case, uh, it was found, or well, the judge commented that there was no good reason um, why the claimant did not consent um, to the footage, uh, have its experts view and comment on the footage uh, such that they could be um, prepared for the trial. Uh, three months being sufficient time uh, to do this. Uh, so the claimants um, in, in a situation like this should have taken um, steps to case manage the evidence, um, uh, prepare for trial, uh, and they're not simply um, entitled to sit back and wait for the defendant um, to obtain permission uh, or simply to, to object to the, um, the evidence. So um, that's the end of the uh, case law part of the um, talk. I'm just going to stop screen sharing now if I can. Um, having quite an interesting situation here, James, where are my um, controls? I've not popped back up again for me in order to be able to share my screen. Hang on, let's see uh, whether I can stop um, doing this. Um, oh, don't we all love Zoom? Um, right. Don't worry. Uh, no, I am. Um, so I, I've been using my multiple screens and uh, this is just not wishing to play. Board. No, that's, that's <laughs> absolutely fine. Because I, I, I was just going to wrap up with um, just, well, I was going to see if there are any questions. I don't think we've, we've got any uh, questions so far, which means uh, either we've covered everything so comprehensively, there's nothing uh, to, to or, you're, or you're still nursing your hangovers from going to the, the pub yesterday. Um, well, <laughs> I'll assume the former, um, you know, for the majority of you, and maybe a couple of you are the latter. But I, I was just going to round up with just a few thoughts on on tactics. Um, thanks to obviously to Laura for mentioning that case of Stuart and Kelly. The other thing with that was that the um, we actually got our cost of the application, um, which is a bit unusual, and I, it was it was because there was such a sort of stonewalling approach by the the claimant so uh, obviously for defendants you can push things along if you have surveillance that's been disclosed and uh, a trial window um, and for a claimant I think you know you've got to take a reasonable view about it and see if you can agree some directions it should by and large be obvious whether something's going to be admissible or not um, so uh, I would you know that, that's that's worth a, worth a look um, it, it, some, some other thoughts um, in terms of uh, 
uh, tactics. Disclosure in these types of cases is key. I, I'm lucky, my, my instructors and solicitors almost always seem to provide, they go through all the medical record, they get all of the medical records from all of the different centres and chronic pain claimants often uh, have multiple uh, attendances at different centres. So uh, get hold of those and there, there will almost always be a, a quite a full and comprehensive summary in chronological order of the records. And that just means as an overview, you can take a look at where the patterns are, are, of complaint are. They're quite often a pre-existent history. And it's also extremely important to chart the development of, of pain complaints after the accident. So that's one key point. Um, if you're a defendant, I'd always make an early part 36 in this sort of case. Uh, they cost quite a lot to run, often disproportionate uh, to, the, to the quantum. Uh, because of the number of experts that, that get involved. And, and if you're a defendant, making a generous uh, part 36 at an early stage, uh, because you've got a pretty clear inkling uh, if it might develop into a pain case, because you know, when it's issued, you're almost always three years post-accident, and if it's a whiplash injury and someone's still got problems or it's dropped out of the portal, uh, and this will be true when the whiplash reforms come in as well, um, you're putting a marker down that means that if you are ultimately successful in, in on causation issues, um, you've got some decent cost protection. Um, for a claimant, I, I think they, they, they can be problematic dealing with those. Um, and you're often cast back on a, a position of saying, well, we just had to commission more evidence to be able to understand our, our position and accept the, the, the offer. Um, so far as experts are concerned, you get the usual suite of experts, don't you? It'll be an orthopedic surgeon and a psychiatrist and a, and a pain expert, possibly. I, I would always ask the experts themselves, um, especially in a relatively early stage, um, do you need further input? Do you need the input of a neurologist if it is a, uh, a, a case of neuropathic pain and alteration to the central nervous system, you know, that's the, they are the experts on the nervous system. So consider a neurologist, uh, would that be appropriate? Uh, rheumatologists as well, they, they might be able to speak better to facet joint uh, problems and pain than, than, a, than a pain expert purely, purely because they do have that rather more overarching uh, qualification and ability. But get a recommendation from your other experts as well about who, who might be useful. And I suppose the other point of general application without going too much into defendant or claimant detail is that once you've got your experts, get as soon as you possibly can, you need a roundtable conference with all of them. Uh, pain claims and, and pain conditions are multidisciplinary problems, uh, multidisciplinary health problems, and they require a multidisciplinary uh, part 35 approach. Uh, and so often the interplay between the experts um, a system in understanding causation issues uh, and formulating uh, their own diagnoses. Um, I see there might be, um, there's a question from uh, Narinda Tagger. Thank you, Narinda. That's very kind. So, uh, and she mentions the consensus seems to be not to send the surveillance to your expert before the defendant gets permission. Um, I think in practice that's right. Um, I, it's very interesting, Laura's, uh, the case Laura talks about of, of Hayden. I mean, Hayden's got pretty much everything's going on and it was, <laughs> everything was happening a bit last minute. And they did, they did I, I think they, they took a real punt by sending it to their experts. And the reason they took a real punt is that uh, I, uh, <laughs> I, had to I had to deal with a case where, um, uh, for a defendant where surveillance evidence had been obtained it was disclosed to the claimant who made all sorts of points about well their bits missing and they weren't too sure that you know um, there were some aspects of it they weren't too sure it was them and, and so, so questions about authenticity and so on and they didn't think it was relevant um, that was done before permission was granted uh, claimant wasn't agreeing to it going in um, it went to a ccmc that that, that um, I, I wasn't at but uh, I, the, the district judge um, went uh, got a bit excited about the whole thing and um, and said no um, this you're presenting this as a fait accompli to me um, you know the, the question of permission should proceed whether the experts see it uh, and so he refused and because the experts had seen it he refused permission to the defendant to rely on those experts 
So it created a huge problem at the CCMC stage. Um, we actually, we had to appeal, um, which is where I became involved. Um, and uh, well, thank, thank it actually, we settled before the appeal was heard. So I don't know what, <laughs> what would have happened, but I suppose that the, the, the simple takeaway is that as, as you say, Narinda, that really it's safest to deal it's safe to deal with it in this way in my view okay when the time comes when you think surveillance should be disclosed you disclose it um it is a document and uh you serve as you would any document now a claimant under the rules has 14 days to dispute the authenticity of a document and this is a little bit people don't realize this and if you miss that 14 day period for objecting to it you're deemed to admit it's authentic so it's a, it's a at that point it's a genuine document that goes in the problem of course is permissions required because you'll need further expert reports the claimant will have to put in a further witness statement and well it should be they should be asking to to do that um, so uh, I, th I think that, that that's really the sensible process uh, and also try and agree directions just to, to get those necessary next steps done. Um, you know, by and large, you'll know whether as a claimant, whether the surveillance shows something that's worth commenting on. And you can see how it was dealt with in those earlier, in those earlier cases Laura referred to where actually if there is something in it and it's not trial by ambush, it, usually it should be allowed in. And that, that sort of approach is, a, is, is commonplace, I think. So I hope that helps. Um, I don't know if you've got anything to add, add Laura on that. I think you probably covered it pretty well in your um, in your case update anyway. I don't have anything to add to that, thanks. No, that's great. Well, look, thank you ever so much everyone for, for, for listening. Um, and we, did, we didn't have too many technical glitches and, and no cars came crashing through the French doors as well. So I'm uh, quite pleased about that. Um, I, th I think uh, the... Um, I might be able to share my screen actually, uh, he says. Um, th there we go. And the reason I'm doing that is simply, um, there we go. Uh, if, if you do have anything further to, 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 to add, I'm sure, or arising, then there are our email addresses. And of course you can get in touch with us via the usual um, approach to, to, to Chambers and the, and the clerks and so on. But um, otherwise, thanks for listening and, and we hope that, uh, that helped you a wee bit. Okay, thanks.